Hello, my friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop, starting on another project. We have an Ibanez Concord guitar. This was made in Japan under strict quality control. How do I know that? Because that's what it says on the label. And it uh, is model number 697, it says. I know it's made in Japan because look at there, there's a label on it. Um, okay, what are we in for? Well, according to my note that I made back at the end of May, May 28th is when this came in. By the way, this came from uh, Illinois, Genesio, Genesio, Illinois. I've never heard of that particular town, G-E-N-E-S-E-O, Illinois. And Carl is the fellow that owns this, and Carl wanted me to look at the uh, neck joint and uh, see if it's coming loose, and it does look like there might be something going on there. Check the braces and the bridge plate. Replace the bridge and flatten the top. Well, the top has got a teeny bit of overbow in it. Um, maybe more than it looks like because it's a little hard to tell when they don't have any tension on there and stuff. But, I mean, if I'm holding this down flat here to the middle, this end is off by a quarter inch. So that means it's about an eighth inch on both sides, roughly. So if I'm holding it flat on the edge, that far end is at least a quarter inch off. Actually, it's probably closer to three-eighths of an inch off. So when you put it in the middle here, it's better than an eighth inch on each side, which is considerable. That's, uh, that's quite a bit. Let me look down this way. It's on a borderline of being a little bit high. It's right on the borderline. I think it's... I think it can be set up the way it is, probably. A lot of that depends on when you get them under tension, what happens. If this top pulls up more, uh, if the neck pulls up more, you know, that kind of thing. Right now, without string, without tension on it, it's, it looks doable. I think what we'll do is tension it up, take a look at it, and see if we notice anything happening. Okay, I'm going to bring it up to standard pitch. I'm, I want to take a look at this neck joint really closely first, though. I want to see if it opens up. In fact, um, I'll get my close-up glasses here where I can see it really good and try to just notice if it's going to open up more than it is. I can tell it's definitely cracked. It's definitely cracked along the edges. So I would say it's gonna probably open up. It's just almost touching right now. Can I move it? I think I can move it. I think I can see it moving just very, very slightly. So we may have some major issues with the neck. I'm gonna see where we go here. has a pretty decent sound. It's got a nice boomy sound. Let's look at the neck joint here and see if we can see if it looks much different. Well, honestly, it doesn't look much different. Looks about the same. That's a good thing, I think. Um, let's see if we can tell any difference on the body here. Yeah, it's every bit as high, that's for sure. I'd say it's probably pulled up a little bit more. It's, it's almost, well, I'd say it's 3 sixteenths of an inch on each side. That's quite a bit. So there's probably something going on on the inside of this thing. And of course, these adjustable bridges, they weaken everything in the whole area here. They're just not that good of a bridge. So we're probably going to get rid of that for sure, and he, of course he asked for that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, let me look down, the, I'm going to look down it, you can't see what I'm doing, but I'm going to look down and see where the neck looks like it is compared to the body. It's, like I said, borderline on the, on the edge of high. 
let's just see what the present action is to see if we have any hope here. It's not as bad as it looks. It's right at a hundred 105 thousandths or so on the bass side. It's better on the treble side, I think. 85 to 90 on the treble side. So we're not, it's not terrible. And we have a reasonable high bridge and thing here. So if we somehow can do some, pull off some miracle and get this, some of the bulge out of this top, I think we'll be fine. I think what I'm going to do on the neck, uh, you know, rather than go to extremes, try to do the simple thing first. I think I'm going to try to fill the neck joint with CA glue and uh, let that just kind of do its thing. You know, we'll do that first thing and that'll have plenty of time to get hard and set up and everything. And uh, by the time we uh, ever string it up again. It, it should be firm and you know it, it CA glue needs time to cure just like any other glue really when especially under stress and I don't really think I can get any other glue in there I think CA glue is the only hope we have for helping the neck joint anyway I think that's the first thing to try we'll we'll see how that goes as is often the case it's been a couple days since I started on this but now I'm getting back to it I'm going to, I think, just go ahead and remove this bridge. We know we're going to replace it at, at the customer's request for one thing. And it is also at least part of the problem with the uh, flex in this top. And, and here's the reason. You can see how weak this is. There, you know, it's weak across these holes. It's weak across here. It's and it's not an overly large bridge to begin with. So, you know, and it's fairly thin. So it's just kind of weak. Not that we can do a whole lot better because we're going to have to kind of keep it in the same dimensions. But at least we won't have a, 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 you know, a through hole all the way through there. We'll have some additional strength because of that. And we will try to make it just a little bit bigger on the profile on the outline to help a little bit too. Uh, every little bit helps, but we're going to get this apart first. So that's the, I got the mechanical parts off the top. Now I'm sure there's a bolt and I feel it in there. There's a bolt right under this deal. I'm not going to worry about uh, making, keeping this perfect. I'm just going to dig it out of there because uh, we have to get to it. And there we go. It looks like it's going to come out without too much trouble. Almost. I thought I had it, but it's playing harder to get now. It, it rocked up there a little bit, but it hasn't come loose yet. There it is. So we got that out. And now we have the screw down in there, which appears to be a Phillips. And... These, it always amazes me too that these are never very tight. Yeah, you know, so this is, it's loose. Okay, I want to see if I can push it back up through the hole. There we got it. Finished taking it loose. And now that's out of there. And when you get right down to it, even that hole adds a little bit more weakness to the whole bridge. So, you know, you got a lot of things stacked against you with a bridge like this. I'm going to get the heat out now and see if we can get this loose. Got my homemade bridge heater, and uh, I have it set for 420 degrees Fahrenheit. It's presently at only 73.5 degrees, but it will heat up rather quickly. It takes it a couple seconds to get started, but once it gets going, it does it fairly quickly. So I'll just let it sit there and uh, do its thing and warm that up. All right, it's only been a couple of minutes. This is almost up to 400 degrees already. It's been sitting on there that whole time. Um, and now the knife is crazy hot, I'm sure, because it doesn't take long for these blades to heat up. I'm going to reach inside and see if I can feel heat through the bridge plate. Yes, I can. I can feel some heat in there. It's not crazy hot, so it's not like it's going to burn anything. 
it's just warm. Now the bridge itself is pretty hot because it's in direct contact, but but it, he, wood does not transfer heat really well. So even though the bridge is very hot, it doesn't transfer that heat too far. About as far as the glue is there on the bottom of the bridge, that's about as far as it goes. We'll see if we can start to make some movement here. Heat that back up a little bit more again. Let's see. I prefer to work from this angle. Ah, not simply. Uh, it's not going to be easy. Wow, it never is whenever you have to take one off. Seems like it's always the hard one. Wow, yeah, it's really hard. Wow, yeah, it's not even trying to come loose. That's kind of typical. Seems like it always works that way. On the ones that you just know you got to take loose, even though, like, it's not, you know, if they're already coming loose, that's a different story. They usually come off much easier. But whenever you, they're not already coming loose, they're usually the hardest ones that you can imagine to get off of there. And this is kind of the reason I don't have any faith in the dry heat removing a neck. You know, this is very thin. Uh, we're putting direct heat directly into that glue and it's not coming loose. So that's why I don't have any faith that dry heat down in here is gonna remove all those glue areas. I know people claim it does, but I'm from Missouri, you'll have to show me that one. Cause I, I, I've tried it, I've tried the dry heat down in there and I got zero results, not, not bad results, I got nothing. I got absolutely zero results. So, other people have different luck than I do, is all I can tell you. Because as hot as this thing is, it's hot enough to scorch the wood. That's how hot it is. 430 degrees is where it's at right now, and now that's hot. Yet, it's not making a dent on this. I can tell you for sure, this would be easier to heat than a neck would be. You have to be very careful on this kind of thing. And I'm trying to be careful, but it's hard to be careful because this can just all of a sudden break loose and go right into your arm like that. That could be really bad. Oh my gosh. Well, something came loose. It kind of came before I was ready. We chipped out a little bit over here, a little bit right here, but not horrible, horrible, but I, I can be, I should be able to replace most of that wood. We'll see where we go from there. There was a pretty big chip out right here in the finish, but I got it glued back in with CA glue, and honestly, you can't really hardly tell it at all, and I think once I buff it out, you won't be able to tell it. So that was the worst part of it. It did tear up quite a bit in here too, but I'm going to work hard to try to get every piece of this back in place. And I don't know if I'll do that or not, but I'm gonna try. And I have to figure out where they go. That's the first problem. I wouldn't worry about it too much, except for this is a plywood deal, and therefore it, there's layers here. And I wanna to try to get the layers back where they go. I'm fairly sure this goes right here where I've got it based on the way it looks. So I'm gonna go with that. You never know how these things are gonna go. Sometimes they go real nice and neat, easy. And this being plywood, it, it has a little different property than your standard wood would have. And it likes to peel out a little bit differently. I knew that when I started this, but I, you just gotta, make it happen sometimes. And of course, I was trying to make it happen. Try to get this glue back under here as good as I can. Difficult to do. This little uh, probe here, it's got a little, kind of like a little 
sponge or something on the end fuzz kind of a brushy fuzzy thing so I think I'm getting it back under there in fact I know I am I can see it going back in quite a ways yeah I think it's gonna work just fine and then I'm gonna put this piece back where it goes and I'm probably gonna stop with that right now because that was the worst I think and then what I'll do is clean that up and clamp that in place there I put a piece of plastic on top of that then I put this block on there to act kind of like a call and hold all that back together that was the worst of it we still have a lot of little pieces that we're going to put back in there we'll put them all back that we can put back and um, we'll just see how it goes the weekend has gone by and I have glued several pieces of wood and loose parts back down here and it's really pretty nice now but there's still one little piece left that I thought I could glue back in place and so I'm going to try to do that anyway we're gonna it seems to fit right there and we're gonna put it back in place one of the reasons this had more tear out than than say the average is that this is a plywood top the reason is the laminations are so thin that they will rip out easier than solid wood would rip out if you were taking the bridge off of a solid wood guitar so there was a lot of little rips in in the laminations but we've been able to put them all back with you know with just very few exception minimal exception on top of that so it's going to be very good it'll be fine I'm just going to apply a little pressure on that with a clamp to keep that really flat while it sets up and I'll give that a couple hours to set up it's a little hard to get the clamps on these things in places because of all the braces on the inside so we'll let that set a little while and then we'll move on okay I have gotten this bridge area repaired as much as I can and it looks pretty darn good really I have taken a rough piece of 2 by material, run it through the thickness sander until this side is really smooth and flat, and you know, touched up the other side to keep it good and flat. And then I've also beveled off the edges so they can't make a crease or a mark on this. And you can see how this rocks on this top. It rocks quite a bit. So my idea is to just clamp this down flat and leave it for a day or two. Not that I think that's going to change anything all that much. It probably won't, but it'll get it uh, to the point where I can, you know, relax it a little bit before I glue the new bridge in here or on here. And uh, that might help reduce the bulge just a fraction. And uh, with a new stiffer bridge, you know, it might help it a little bit. It's not going to help it a great amount, but every little bit helps. Every little bit counts. So we'll see how this goes. Got to be a little careful with this kind of idea because you could break something if you put too much pressure on something. But I, I've done this before many times successfully, and I think it'll be okay. Just got to be a little careful though. You don't want to go cranking down too hard. Now when I look across the back here, I can see it's pretty flat compared to the way it was for sure. It's, way, it's real flat. I'm just going to set it off aside now and just let it set that way for a day or so and uh, at least 24 hours. That'll just give it a little bit of relaxation there or you know strain relief so when I put the new bridge on it maybe we can keep it a little uh, flatter you never know it might help well I've got a good head start on making the new bridge and I've obviously I, as always I left it a little bigger than the original bridge it's not hugely different if I can even try to give you an example here you can maybe see the border around it there. It's not much different. It's, uh, but yet every little bit makes a difference in strength. And the biggest difference in strength on this is going to be that I don't have this big hole cut through it. I don't have the extra hole. And um, I'm leaving these 
wings uh, 30 thousandths thicker on each end. These are really thin. These are only down to 100 thousandths, which is even thinner than average. And so anyway, that's going to make a big difference in keeping this whole top flat when you get this all glued down. I'm also hand working this back edge here because uh, I need to round it off. I could do this on a sander, but you know, I can cut a lot of wood faster with uh, the finger plane. The finger plane really works good for things like this, for shaping. So I'll just round off the back of this with the finger plane and then I'll go to the sander to clean it up. Just speeds up the process. You can see that it cuts off a lot really fast. If you know how to use a finger plane, it is definitely your friend. The only thing I need to do these days in addition is use these close-up glasses, which I can see it pretty good without the glasses, but they help. This wants to be cut the other way. It wants to be cut this way, and it's it's difficult when you get down here where you're kind of cutting the end grain. It only wants to be cut this one way, so you kind of have to go with the way the wood wants to be cut or you're going to be fighting it. All right, I'm going to just go to a sander now and sand it off a little bit. Well, I've done a little bit of hand sanding on that now. It's starting to look pretty nice. For my millimeter friends, I mentioned earlier that uh, I'd left this 30 thousandths thicker. That would be about 0.75 millimeters, not, not quite one millimeter. So it's not very much thicker, but every little bit counts. And then the other thing I do is all these sharp corners, I try to just take sandpaper and you know, knock them down where they're, where you don't feel an edge. And that would apply to the front edge also. And it doesn't have to be knocked down too much, just enough that you don't feel that really sharp edge. Because it's really sharp if you don't knock it down a little bit. It's a little bit like deburring a piece of steel when you're working in a on a machine. That's pretty fine right there. I'm not going to oil it now because I don't want to contaminate the underside surface for the glue, but eventually we'll put some oil on this. I think I will go ahead and mark off my holes, um, assuming that I can hold it still here, and I think I can. Try to center it on there really well, and I'm going to just mark them with a pencil. And I'll go over to my drilling jig, and if I have a drill jig that fits it really well, then I'll use it. But if it doesn't fit it very well, I'll uh, just drill these by hand. And the reason is, I don't want to weaken the top anymore. I want to get the holes in the exact same spot. So, there you go. One of my viewer customers back in the early days when I did that Regal Wreck, he sent me these drill guides that he had made. This one just happens to fit the holes pretty well. Would I say they're perfect? I'd say no, but they're so close that it doesn't really matter, I don't think. So I'm gonna go ahead and use his drill guide on this. What I'll do is run a board under here to hold it up off my drill table and then just drill straight through. So you can see I was able to drill those holes with that guide. It does a really wonderful job. Once you drill your two end holes, you put the pins in and then you can drill the other three or four with uh, perfect alignment. So I say thank you again, Tom, for that wonderful drill jig. It's very handy. I've used it quite a few times over the years. It's the next morning. I just took the board off of here that I was pressing this flat with. I set my new bridge on here, put the pins in here to kind of help hold it. And now I'll get out an X-Acto blade and start tracing this. Really disappointed with the newest X-Acto blades. They bend on the ends. They're just really junk. They've changed hands or something is what I understand. And the, you know, just like every company, they always have to come in and cut costs and make things cheaper. And the new X-Acto blades are junk. The old X-Acto blades were awesome. 
So let's see if I can do it. I'll use a scalpel here. This will be the first time I've used a scalpel for this. I haven't used them in the past because these little this bump here gets in my way a lot of times. In this case, I don't think it'll get in my way. I'm trying not to cut the wood, just to cut the finish. Sometimes that's hard to do. So now I've got to peel all that off of there. I've got my little planer blade here. It's pretty sharp and that's what I typically use. This little block of aluminum that I have here is just a round piece of scrap aluminum. The neural has nothing to do with anything. It's just what I found in the scrap bin. It, the main thing is that there's an angle slot cut in here with a screw holding the blade in. And then I round it off the bottom so I can get down nice and low. You could say, why don't you just use a chisel? And you can, but the chisel is flat. Uh, this blade is round and curved and that gives me a, a rocking ability and just a little, you know, just a finer touch for this kind of detail work and it doesn't dig in like this square bladed chisel will, will dig in. But anyway, I want all of the finish off of the gluing area because, um, you know, you want a wood to wood contact 100%. I've, I've said many times that when you're doing a bridge, this is not the place to get in a hurry. It's not in the place to cut, it's not the place to cut corners. You know, you don't take any risks here. You do it 100% right. And when you put it on there with good glue and perfect coverage and good clamping, it shouldn't ever come off. I honestly don't recall ever having an instrument come back because the bridge came off in all the years I've been doing this. I shouldn't say that on camera because you know what that means. It usually means it's going to happen, but but so far, I've been pretty lucky. You know, if, if it's going to come off, it would be one like this because it's a plywood um, veneer and that veneer can separate and these kind of bridges can come off many times easier than a solid wood top. But I think all the veneer on this is solid so we should be fine. Anyway, I'm not going to make you watch the rest of that. I'm just going to keep peeling this off and I'll show you what the next step is. Okay, I've got uh, things ready to go. The um, area has been cleaned off real well. There's, it's pretty flat. So I'm going to set this call up inside here. I've got some two-way tape on it, but sometimes I have luck with that holding and sometimes not so much. We'll see if it does this time. My normal, when the tops are flat, I can just lay this on here and I can feel it lock in because I've knocked the finish away. But in this case, this top is not very flat and it's really hard to tell if I'm exactly in the right place. So this one's gonna be one of the harder ones. It's doable and we'll get it done, but it's not as easy as it could be. Let's see if we can get this clamp on because that call is really thick and I, I wanted a thick call on purpose, but honestly it might not be doable. Yeah, and this one's this clamp may not go on there. The other ones are just a hair bigger. And so maybe they will. If I can at least just get them on the get two clamps on it right now. That looks like that'll work. So I'm trying it dry before I get the glue on it. Boy, it just barely goes on there. Let's make sure the other one will, because you never know, there could be a problem. And then I might be able to find some other clamp I can put in the middle, since this one doesn't seem like it's gonna go. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, the lime in it looks pretty good too right now, but it's much easier to align them dry than it is wet. All right, let's give it a shot. We'll get the glue on here. Once more, I'm just going to 
knock the glaze off with this with my uh, tooth blade and it's really not making big deep scratches if that's what you're thinking. I'm just getting rid of the shiny glaze. I want to be able to have the glue stick to the wood rather than that shiny glazy surface that happens on these type types of woods. <sighs> that's much better. It's nice and smooth but yet it's not glazed, glazed over. And then we'll put glue on both surfaces. Again, as I said, you don't take any shortcuts on this. I like a paintbrush because it works the glue, I think, into the pores or into every little tiny crack and crevice. Where if you take a spreader, um, you can actually spread right over an air bubble. This, this doesn't seem to leave any air bubbles when you use a brush and I don't want any air bubbles. Before I get the clamps on, I'm going to try to wipe up any extra glue, and the reason is, uh, it's for mostly for alignment purposes, so I can see the lines. Like I said, I can't make this one fit in the finish like I can usually make make them do. The other night I woke up from a dream. This dream to me is so really seen. And in this dream I came upon a man. A man who left no footprints in the sand. Some people tell me I don't need all these clamps, that just one clamp is enough. But I, you also heard me say earlier that I've never had one of these bridges come loose in almost 40 years of doing this. So I'll stick by my method. You can go ahead and use the one clamp method if you prefer. Dressed on the wide, we walked along the way. For those in need, we'd often stop and pray. Our journey guided only by the night. All right, so now, now I'm slowly putting the pressure on it. And we've got that big thick call down there to keep it flat. That's the main reason, of, that's the main purpose of the call. You know, a lot of people think it's to keep these clamps flat. I don't much care whether the clamps are flat or not. I'm, I much more care whether or not the top is flat. And that's what the thick call will help you with. And yet we walked as if there was a line. Then he said, walk the straight and narrow every day. Then he said, head straight toward the light and never stray. Then he said, lend a helping hand along the way. Then he said, find the love of God on judgment day. I'm going to check the tightness. They're really tight, but I'm just, you know, you can't be too sure. You want to make it really good. All right, I'm gonna see if this middle clamp will go on here. I don't think it will, but give it a shot. I think I'm gonna go put this in my mill and mill the end of this off. At least I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna do something, maybe just a grinder or something to get rid of that. Well, after cutting that jaw down a little bit, I could get this one on there as well. So there you go. That's a much better thing. And now in the future, I won't have that issue. Well, I took the clamps off the uh, guitar after it set overnight and the bridge seems to be perfectly fine. I've already drilled the through holes uh, to line them up. They're pretty much were there and lined up anyway, but uh, there's glue and stuff gets in them, so I've already drilled those out. Now I'm just chamfering the top of the, of the holes. This uh, bit does a great job without any chatter and uh, just does a nice, really nice job. That's why I like to use it. I've, you know, I've got at least a dozen different chamfering bits and all of them have some kind of issue. This doesn't have any issues. Yeah, I really like that bit. It just does a nice clean job. See how nice and neat it looks? Well, my friends, I've got my intonation rig on here, as you can see, and I have the two strings tuned up to an E. And when I check the tuner, and I'll let you see the tuner here, hopefully you can see it. I'll even zoom in a little bit 
it's not necessary that you actually see me hitting the notes, but you can see there we're hitting pretty close to center on the needle. And we're still hitting pretty close on the, on the needle, almost perfect in fact. Center on the needle, center on the needle. Now, my point in showing you that really is to tell you, to show you the difference. You see how straight that bridge is? It's almost straight. It, it does have a little bit of lean like they typically do toward the small E. It's leaning that way a little bit, but very little. Look at the difference in this one. Now, of course, it had the giant slot, but you can see it's quite a bit further back here than it is up here. So you can tell this was much more angled. So, you know, the intonation could never have been exactly right with this. So it's pretty darn close this way. So now all I need to do is mark that. And uh, what I typically do is mark the front edge because that's the edge that matters. And I've got my fine uh, pencil here. This is a um, Graph Gear 1000, and it's got a 0.5 millimeter lead in there. So it makes a real fine mark. And you notice I'm just making the mark under the string right where the saddle is, because that's really the line that counts. And now I can take a straight edge and draw the line. And when we route it, it doesn't really matter how wide we route. The, the thing that matters is that we route it up to this edge. And so that when we put the new saddle in, no matter how wide the saddle is, the front edge is the place that matters. And that's the place that sets your intonation for the length of your string. Don't know how well this will show up, but I do have a very fine pencil line there, and I have it terminated there and terminated here. And uh, in other words, when I route it, I'll be routing behind this line, and I'll stop at those two lines there. That's, uh, that gives me the longest possible saddle I can sit on top of this. And the longer your saddle is, the more it spreads out the sound. So that's always a good thing, too. Well, we're at the nerve-wracking part of this now. I have my rig set up and I have it all locked down in place. I took a lot of time to make sure that the bit is going to cut on the on that side of the line, but yet it's going to touch the, the line. That's very important to your intonation. This is where the pucker factor comes in. You, you could really mess everything up you've done up to this point with this. And I'm not just saying that because it's it's hundred percent true. So I really have to be careful I really have to pay attention to what I'm doing more or less hope for the best. That's just about the bottom line of it Well, it went pretty well, as, about as well as it can go. <sighs> that is nerve wracking, I will say that. Okay, that's not deep enough, I can tell already. Um, I'm going to uh, measure the depth there. As soon as I find my calipers, they leap all over the shop. My able-bodied assistant here handed them to me, so there you go. Now we'll just check. I'm going to say we're in the neighborhood of 100 thousandths or so. 128 thousandths is where we're at. If we double that, we'd be approximately a quarter inch. I don't think that would be a problem. I'm going to just check the depth of this right now. Yeah, the depth of this is 300 and one in, uh, 300 thousandths, so 250 would be a quarter inch. So I think I'm going to set it to go almost that deep again. I'll probably set it just a little less than that deep and uh, we'll be right back with you and show you what that looks like. Okay, I've used my depth gauge to mark out another hundred thousandths of an inch and I'm gonna drop it down that much. So here we go. Not one of us on earth can understand Just how our life fits in the master's plan We must learn to lend a hand along the way so we may find the love of God in judging day. If he said walk the straight and narrow every day. 
we're successful. I'm going to call that good enough. Well, I, you can see I have made the saddle that fits the slot. I'd like to tell you that that was really easy. I would love to tell you that, but it wasn't. It took quite a bit of effort to get that in there. It is absolutely perfectly snug tight though. You know, it's you really have to press to get it in there and you pretty much can pick up the guitar with it, but it goes all the way down to the bottom. So now we just need to shape the top and uh, I'll do some shaping on this and we'll put some strings on this and show you what that looks like. Now that I've got the uh, saddle cut down and installed. I'm going to do a quick fret leveling and check the frets to make sure that they're fairly flat. I can feel a little drag. That little drag is always an indication that there's a high fret. Like right there, there's definitely a high fret. It's dragging right here. This fret is being cut right here. Did he said, let's straight toward the light and never stray. Then he said, lend a helping hand along the way. Then he said, find the love of God on judgment day. So now I check it and see which frets have not been touched. You know, this there's spots on several of them that haven't been touched. So I'm going to go back over them a little bit more. One of the things that you can do, especially when you're new at this and you need a little additional help, is you can take a, a marker and put black marks on top of your frets. This is a fine point. We really need a thicker point. Here we go. So we take a, 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 a Sharpie like this and you just mark the tops of your frets. It's a good idea to do that because there's always a chance that you have a low fret and, and it won't show up. This is a great way to be sure that all your frets are getting filed to the level point. And it will also show you quickly which ones are getting filed first, meaning that those are your high frets. I don't do this very often because I feel like I've got a good feel for doing this without that technique, but that technique will really help you if you're, if you're new at this. That looks pretty good. That shows you pretty quickly that you've got all your frets uh, at least dressed. Like this one back here doesn't look like it's been touched, but the odds are that's just a decoration fret anyway. That should take care of that section. Then once you get it leveled like this, I typically clean them off, keep it cleaned off, just because it just seems to make a nicer job for me. The next thing I do is take the recrowning file and go back over it. What I try to do now is to re-round the tops of the frets. Do they have to be perfect? No. I, and I'll show you that you can make them appear to be perfect in the next step. The thing you don't want to do is to take the top of the fret down with your recrowning file. You want to keep the tops perfectly flat. In fact, it's best if you could leave just a very narrow flat spot across the top of each fret. Another way you could do that would be to color them all again like so. And I'll just color a couple of them here. So we'll just color these first three. Then you recrown them like this and you keep going until you just have a very narrow strip of black there. And that's all I really want. I don't, I don't want it perfectly round because if I do that, I'm probably gonna drop this by a thousandth or two. And if you drop it a thousandth or two, when you note, when you note at that fret that's been dropped, then the next fret could potentially buzz. You don't wanna drop any of them. You wanna keep them all flat within the same plane. So making them perfectly round is a bit overrated. You don't need them perfectly round. You want to get them semi-round. I'll finish rounding these off off camera and then I'll show you the next step. Okay, now that we have the frets leveled and recrowned, 
All we need to do now is finish the polishing of the frets. I use three potential methods to polish the frets. First, I start with 600 wet or dry sandpaper. I'll show you two techniques for doing this, and it really depends on you and how and what you're trying to accomplish on which technique you want to to uh, use. It also can depend on how nice your your fretboard is. If your fretboard is pristine and it's really perfect, then you will probably want to use this first method. And the first method is you find yourself, you know, a uh, cover like this. These are sold at uh, musical instrument supply places, and you put that cover on here. And then you just take your 600 sandpaper and you work it back and forth. And when I work this back and forth, I rock it from one side to the other, from one side to the other. And this will help give the illusion of the fret is perfectly round. Even though it may not be perfectly round, it will look like it is. This also gets rid of any scratching left by the fret files. It doesn't take a lot. If you're spending a ton of time doing it, you're probably not doing it well. It just, it just should only take, oh, maybe 30 seconds per fret, something like that, if that much. And you just, you just want to rock from one side to the other and get it as cleaned up as you can get it without really trying to lower the fret again. In a case like the sandpaper though, it will be difficult to lower the fret very much. Okay, so one more time just to show it. We'll do three of them this way and I'll do the rest another method. Now on a fretboard that's not pristine like this one, there's a lot of scratches and different things and dirt and miscellaneous on this fretboard. I typically do it a different way. I typically do it this way. And some of you will say, this will leave scratches in it and it won't be perfectly smooth. I defy you to feel a scratch in it. There is no scratches left with 600 sandpaper going this way. This is 10 times faster. Make that 20 times faster. It's way faster. And you will get the illusion of the round frets much quicker this way than you will the other way. This works very well. I encourage you to do this, but you just have to realize that you're gonna have another step after this. And I definitely would do this if your fretboard needs this extra step. If it doesn't need this next step, which I'm about to show you, then I would use the first method of using this. But this one definitely needs the second step that I'm about to show you. So I'm just doing this. Now that's how quick it is. It's pretty much done already. You just can refine it a little bit. If you see a spot maybe where you need a little extra work, then you can refine it like that. And then if you look at them, they all look like they're perfectly round. They look really good. All right, so what is this extra step? Actually, before I get to the next step, I'm going to show you my third method for polishing frets. We're going to take semi-chrome polish and, and polish a few of these frets. Now, you can use your own judgment on how to mix and match all of these techniques I'm using here because they can be used at different times and different stages. But I'm showing you the final step in polishing these frets to make them look like a mirror. You don't have to go beyond this step that you see right here right now because it looks perfectly fine. But if you want to make your frets look like a mirror, then you just take your semi-chrome polish and just a teeny little dab and you just do this. After you've sanded, this will make them look like a mirror. And again, you kind of go from one side to the other and you just have to use your judgment and your own ideas on this. But it takes just a little bit of elbow, elbow grease, doesn't take that much. If you've done a good job sanding, and you'll see here that 
this is going to look like a mirror. Now I'll just wipe it off real clean with, a, with the dry part of the rag. Now look at that and see how shiny that is. That first fret is the only one that's been buffed. But that also shows you that, you know, sanding this way is fine because I did go back over these with this method also and you can tell that there's no scratches left. So you can't buff out a scratch with this buffing polish unless you would spend hours. I mean, you know, scratches, this just shines up the metal. Okay, I'm not going to go to the trouble of polishing every fret on this guitar. I think it would cost the customer more money than he's wanting to invest in it because of the time. So, instead of polishing each fret, I've already shown you that I've, you know, I've buffed them all off with the sandpaper. So what is that other technique that you have to do whenever you use the method of going this way? Use one more step you have to do. Otherwise, it won't look very nice. Now this step, I'll have to tell you, is a difficult step to master. This one is, this one takes practice, and that is we're gonna scrape the fingerboard with a single edge razor blade and you should get razor blades that are 0.012 thousandths thick. 0.009 is your standard. Those are too thin. You want the you want the 0 0.012. You can get it done with the 09s, but they're just so thin that they don't work very well. These these 12 thousandths of an inch thick blades work much better for the next technique. And so that technique is learning how to scrape the entire fingerboard. It will scrape your pearl, it will scrape everything and make it all one level plane. And you will get rid of finger grooves, fingernail marks, things like that with this technique also. All right, I'm just gonna show you one or two more here and then, then I'm going to uh, Finish the rest off camera. Now this is a difficult technique. You have to hold the blade very firmly, very tightly, and you have to apply a little bit of pressure and keep it going. Otherwise, if you do it loosely or whatever, you're gonna get chatter and you're gonna see marks in it. But if you do it firmly and tightly like I just did, then it turns out pretty darn nice. And it does a nice job. And then you can oil the fingerboard after that, and I'll show you that as the final step. Okay, you can see all the debris on the fretboard, and the reason for that debris, of course, is because I was using this scraping technique. Once you get the frets all scraped down, then you can clean the fingerboard once more. <clears throat> there is still one more step that I believe is necessary. You could get away without doing this step, but I recommend that you do it. And that is you take the corner of the razor blade and you run it along like the nut here and clean out the little debris that gets down in the nut because when you scrape back and forth, it forces debris into the, into the edges. And so there will be some minor debris at each fret and you just take the corner and you rub along that and clean it out. There's not much, and on some fretboards there will be more than on others. But typically there's a little bit there, so I just run this right along every fret, and it cleans out the junk. Now you notice I'm only cleaning one side of the fret. What I do is just do one side like this, then I spin the guitar around because it's easier for me to pull this than it is to push it, just like it would be easier to pull a chain than to push a chain. So you just turn it around and now you do the other side of the fret. And you can do this very quickly once you learn the technique, but just like the first technique, it does take a little bit of practice. But if you take your time, you can do it just fine. Okay. Once that's finished, then you just clean the guitar, the fretboard one more time, and you basically have a completed fret job. 
Now the only thing left to do is to oil it. For oil, I recommend either boiled linseed oil, which is an excellent choice. So I don't knock that choice at all. It's a very good choice. Lately, over the last couple of years, I've been using a product called Be Good Oil. This comes from Klingspor. That's the only place I know you can get it. But uh, it's an excellent uh, oil with wax built into it. The Be Good means that it's got beeswax in it. And this is supposedly food safe, so you can put this on other woodworking projects too, like if you were turning bowls or whatever. Then you can just wipe this on. It doesn't take very much. A little tiny bit goes a very long way. So you can just dab it on your finger like that. That's one method. You can just drop a two or three on here and then smear the drops out. But, you know, if, it is a pricey uh, alternative. So you might want to, uh, you know, use it sparingly, although it goes a long way. I have had this same bottle and I couldn't honestly tell you how many fingerboards and, and uh, bridges and things that I've oiled with it. Just probably in the in the hundreds by now so even though it's pricey it goes a long way another alternative if you can't get into the cracks is you could use a brush and apply it with a brush I'm just gonna go ahead and smear it on here a little bit more and get it get it over with And now for this new handmade bridge that I have, I'm going to pull the saddle back out and I'm going to oil this as well. This is a piece of rosewood that's had no finish put on it. So this Be Good Oil is a good option to apply something that's similar to a finish without actually being a finish. Makes it look real nice, darkens it up, once you get these oils put on, whether it's the boiled linseed oil or whether it's this Be Good oil, then you want to wipe it off very well. Some people would ask, why would you want to wipe it off? Why don't you want to let it soak in? You can try that and it won't hurt anything to let it soak in, but you don't want to let it dry without wiping it off. Wiping it off will keep it from getting tacky or sticky or whatever, and especially with boiled linseed oil. You want to wipe it off, and it's even a good practice with boiled linseed oils to come back five minutes later and wipe it off again, because it will seep back out of the pores. That's really about as nice as it gets right there. So that's what the fretboard looks like. Looks pretty much like a brand new fretboard. And of course you can see our bridge there and it looks really nice as well.